Um, good evening, everybody, and welcome uh, to this evening. I want to begin with the boring stuff. Um, it's okay to take photographs, but please don't use flashes. It, it's very bad for the video. So you're, you're, you're welcome to take a photograph, but please turn off your flash, uh, the flash on your camera. Uh, as usual, please turn off your cell phone. I just turned mine off uh, because that can also be somewhat disruptive. And um, afterwards, uh, Nawal El Sadawi will be uh, will be out there, and she'll be uh, willing to sign uh, books for you. So those are the the as it were preliminaries. And now um, let me get started with the more formal part of the evening. So I'm Kwame Anthony Appiah. I'm president of the Penn American Center, and I, I'd like to welcome you. Um, I, I'll take that to be applause for the Penn American Center. Um, and I'd like to welcome you to the fourth of these Arthur Miller Freedom to Write lectures. Um, Penn's project here and in the other 143 Penn centers around the world is to sustain and protect literary culture in each of our countries and regions. And this evening's lecture honors the name of a distinguished Penn member who was also one of our most devoted supporters of free expression. What's more, we do so in the context of our Penn World Voices Festival, thus uniting two of Penn's guiding aims, to bring writers and writings across borders in ways that enrich all of humankind and to support free expression, freedom of expression around the planet. Today's speaker has faced imprisonment and the threat of assassination for her outspoken defense of the human rights of people, but especially of women, and especially in her native Egypt and in the African and Arab worlds in which Egypt is embedded. She knows what it is to have your rights of free expression trampled upon. She's also one of the major women writers of our time, whose many works in Arabic have been translated into scores of languages, from Spanish to Swedish, from, Tamil, uh, from Turkish to Thai, from Italian to Indonesian, and the list is very long. Dr. Nawal El Sadawi was born in the village of Kafra Tahla, she'll tell me if I got that right, on the banks of the Nile, was educated at Cairo University, graduating in medicine in 1955 and specializing in psychiatry, and rose to be the Director General of Public Health in the Egyptian Ministry of Health. But from the very beginning of her medical career and from before, she was already a writer, and she told me to make it clear that that's what her primary identification is as a writer. Uh, writing fiction, uh, and her, in fact, her, her first uh, short stories were published in 1957 as I Learned Love, and were followed swiftly a year later by a novel, uh, Memoirs of a Woman Doctor. In an essay on writing and freedom of hers, which I read, which was published in 1993, she wrote in a translation that is due to Amira Nawaira, from the moment the world of writing opened itself before me, I started to follow a route that was drastically different from the one preordained for me before birth. Since these books, she has written more than a dozen novels, scores of short stories, three plays at least, and memoirs and autobiographical works, including Memoirs from the Women's Prison, which recounts her experience as a political prisoner under Anwar Sadat in 1981. It is an extraordinary contribution to the genre of the prison memoir, for which, alas, our, the last century has provided too many occasions. A decade later, she was effectively exiled from Egypt for a few years when her life was threatened by Islamists. So her free expression has been denied both by the Egyptian government and by its most strenuous opponents. Among her best known works is the 1979 novel, Woman at Point Zero, which is based on a prison encounter with a Kyrene prostitute awaiting her death sentence for murdering a pimp. Throughout her life and her work, El Sadawi has championed the rights of women and she's one of the leading opponents of the practice of female genital cutting, FGM, female circumcision. There are many debates about what we should call it. Her feminism has expressed itself not only in her writing, but in her work for the health ministry as a psychiatrist and as an activist. She's the founder and president of the Arab Women's Solidarity Organization, which was banned for the first time in 1991. <laughs> and she's co-founder of the Arab Association for Human Rights. 
Dr. Nawal El Sadawi has received honorary degrees on three continents and many literary prizes. In 2004, she won the North South Prize of the Council of Europe. In 2005, the Inanna International Prize in Belgium. I could continue with a recitation of her honors, her works, or her activities, but instead, I'll ask you please to welcome Nawal El Sadawi. for this encouraging introduction <laughs> and uh, I am really happy to share this uh, conversation this time with uh, Anthony. Uh, I just met him two days ago and we became friends. <laughs> you know, I suspect that happens a lot. <laughs> sometimes you meet people and uh, you are never friends. You can live with them in the same room, in the same bedroom, and they are strangers. <laughs> and sometimes you meet people in conferences like that and you become friends. That's creativity. Creativity is not just writing. Creativity in human relationships, in friendship, in love, in all that. We cannot separate because some people think creativity is just to write or the freedom is just freedom to write. In fact, I cannot see you, and this is inequality. Because you see me, I cannot see you. Uh, so can we see each other? This is one of the major problems of conferences, that we are up, and you are a little bit down. We are in the light, you are in the darkness. And uh, it is very difficult for me to, to speak when I don't see the eyes of people, when I don't see their faces, because I am inspired by you, by your presence. So now I cannot see you. Can you see them? I think they're raising they, the light. Can you diminish the light a little bit, or, or is it the television? No, I think, I think we can raise the lights a bit. Can you hold the mic closer to your mouth, please? Okay, okay. Uh, Oh, that's too much. That's too much. No, it's okay. It's, okay. it's too close. Is it okay like that? Okay. Uh, I like to be comfortable when I talk. I remember I was invited to California in one of the big universities, and I was supposed to speak about democracy. And the situation was very undemocratic. Because we were sitting very up, up, maybe higher than that, in a very, and, and where, what they call position or positioning is very important. How we sit, how we talk to each other is very important. And equality is important in dialogue. But anyway, I am supposed to speak about the freedom to write. But is the freedom to write separate from other freedoms? Economic freedom, political freedom, sexual freedom? Uh, we, here you have the free market, the free market everywhere. Is the free market really free? Because the word freedom, sometimes very misleading, sometimes it's an illusion. You know, you feel free, but really you are not free. It's like when I ask women who are veiled, why you are veiled? They say, we are free, we chose the veil. I ask women who put makeup, and the makeup is another veil, I call it postmodern veil. <laughs> I ask women why you put the makeup, they say, we are free. Or women who are naked in parties and they show half of their breasts, I ask them why you are naked, they say, we are free. So freedom to dress or freedom to undress freedom to be veiled or not to be veiled or to be naked. This is not freedom. This is an illusion. This is really an illusion. And the freedom to write, there is, I haven't seen really in any country freedom to write or freedom to express ourselves. There is subtle censorship in the United States. Of course, the censorship in Egypt 
is very crude and harsh and visible, but here maybe the censorship is more dangerous because it's subtle and invisible. <laughs> it's very invisible and it's embedded in the most sophisticated freedom uh, to write and express and it is in the big media and in the big academia. So uh, I am very cautious when I speak about the freedom to write. Uh, that's number one. Number two, I think we live in one word, not three words. I am very much against the word third word. They ask me, are you a third word? You come from the third word? This is an insult to me. I am not from the third world, and this country is not the first world, because when you have George Bush that go to Iraq and kill people, this is not a first world man. So, so we have to be very, we should not use this language. This is very colonial language, but we use it in our writing. Like the word post-colonial in the academia, they say post-colonial as if we finished colonialism. We are, <laughs> we are in the neo-colonial period. Also, the Middle East, they say I am from the Middle East. Every day I hear the word Middle East, and it's an insult to me. Why? We were named Middle East by the British colonizers. So we were, Egypt were middle relative to London, and India was the far east relative to England. Uh, so we were named by our colonizers relative to them. So now when I go to London, from Egypt to London, I say I'm going to the Middle West. <laughs> okay. When I come to the United States, I say I'm coming to the Far West. <laughs> you laugh. You, la you are laughing about a ridiculous language. But we use this ridiculous colonial language every day in our writing, in our academia, in the media, and nobody loves. So we have to change the language in order to be free. Because if we cannot change the language, we are not free. We are dominated by the big powers in the academia, in politics, in economics, in religion. I'll come to religion. In fact, I'm supposed to be brief because, uh, no, because I would like to have a dialogue and conversation with Anthony and maybe hopefully with you, but maybe we'll not have that time. Anyway, so what I would like to say that, uh, what was I? Uh, religion. Ah, religion. <laughs> Yesterday, uh, and that's the danger of the big media, how we are brainwashed in a subtle way, and how we receive false information and false knowledge all the time, under knowledge, authority, we receive. And that's why we never have real knowledge. We receive false knowledge, fragmented knowledge, in the academia, in the media, by people who have authority. And this delay, the revolution, we are supposed, this panel, this pen festival about revolution, evolution, I'll come to that. So, yesterday in the New York Times, yesterday was Saturday. So I read a big article with a very famous authoritarian person speaking about religion. And he said, Science um, has called facts. Reason is called. There is no passion. Uh, there is no compassion in science. That's why people go back to religion. In fact, he doesn't know. He doesn't know even political analysis. Because my political analysis, or the political analysis of many people, for this backlash, going back to religion, 
has nothing to do with passion or compassion or that we lack passion and compassion in science. It's political. Bin Laden and George Bush are twins. You know, they needed each other. The whole problem of religious fundamentalism and going back to uh, uh, Islamic fundamentalism or Christian fundamentalism or Jewish fundamentalism, it's political, it's economic. But he wrote religion about as if religion is separate, number one, from politics, though religion is a political ideology. Then he spoke about science about, as if science has no passion or compassion. I am a medical doctor, and I, I felt a lot of passion and compassion as a medical doctor to my patients. And if we really understand science, it's full of passion and compassion and passion and, and feelings. There is no separation between feeling and thinking. There is no separation between my body, my spirit, and my mind, you know. So, but he was bringing, he was a victim of this split that we inherited from slavery between the physical and the spiritual between science and art. And he said, people go back to religion because science is cold and has no passion and compassion. And this is not true, but who can answer him? If I write an article to reply to him to the New York Times, they will never publish it, you know, because I am not famous like him, so they will never publish me. So the problem with writing is that the freedom to write can veil the mind and can do the opposite, can, can unveil the mind and lead to real knowledge and real understanding of the dynamics in the world. Because we do not receive this knowledge from schools or universities. We receive fragmented knowledge I graduated from the medical college not understanding politics. I have to study politics. I have to study religions. I have to study sexuality. Even we didn't study sexuality. We didn't study the harms of female circumcision and male circumcision. Male circumcision is very harmful. But we, nobody, no, we didn't study that. We didn't study it. So it's a big problem. And we have really to be critical, even to sacred things. We have to criticize God. We have to criticize heads of states. We have to criticize anything. Without this critical mind, we cannot be creative. And without this critical mind and creativity, we cannot have, we cannot have revolution. We cannot have social revolution. We cannot have collective re revolution because writers can help in this illumination. They can help in this revolution or the opposite. And that's the problem. Writing is very powerful and it can be against knowledge and can be with knowledge. It depends where you stand. Are you in the market? Are you working for the, writing for the market to have the Nobel Prize, to have a high post, to have a lot of money, to be secure, not to go to prison because you are afraid of torture, of prison, or, or what? And that's the question. Why we did not stop the war? Why we did not change this jungle? We are living in a jungle. When a country, a superpower, a big country go to another smaller country and invade it, as Palestine was invaded, as Iraq was invaded, as Afghanistan is invaded. When we live in such a jungle, and then you don't expose it, and you don't challenge political taboos, sexual taboos, religious taboos, and go to prison. Yes, go to prison. What's going to happen? I was happy in prison. <laughs> because we are living in a big prison. We are not free. We think we are free. We are all prisoners. 
of the system, but we are not aware of that. I would like to say we need a revolution, really, collective, social, political, economic revolution, and writers can do it. Everybody can do it, help in doing it. We have to do that. It's a responsibility. There is no freedom without responsibility. If I am free, I am responsible. But nobody speaks about responsibility to the others. In fact, creativity means to be responsible towards the self and the others, to fight for your liberation and liberation of the others. So uh, we need to do that. And writing is a very powerful weapon. I remember in prison, the jailer comes every day to my cell, the jailers, and they inspect my cell, looking for a piece of paper and pen. And the head of them used to tell me, if I find paper and pen in your cell, it is more dangerous than if I find a gun. <laughs> you see? how writing, how the pen is important, is powerful, if it's really used against injustice, against hypocrisy, against lies, if the pen is used with responsibility and with freedom, then we can change the world. Thank you very much. So um, you've written about many things, you've done many things, and so we could talk about many things. Um, and, but I'd like to start, if I may, since you said rightly that what you are above all else is a writer, mm -hmm. uh, just to talk a little bit about the history of your writing, about how you came to write. You grew up between a small village on the bank of the Nile and your grandfather father's house in Cairo, so you, you went back and forth between the city and the country, mm -hmm. in a country where n a lot of uh, women, in, young women in your village wouldn't have had a good education. Mm -hmm. um, you say that the fact that you became a medical doctor was partly the result of your father's decision, not yours. He, he wanted you to be mm -hmm. a medical doctor. That was also rather unusual. So there must have been something unusual about your family to mm -hmm. explain um, some of the unusual things about you. <laughs> So just yes, yes, exactly. I, uh, I had a problem with two things in my childhood. Uh, I had a brother who was older than me, and I was better than him in school and at home. I worked in school and I worked at home. He played in school and at home <laughs> because he was a boy. <laughs> But just because he was a boy, he had a lot of privileges, though my parents were relatively liberal and they sent me to school. My cousins didn't go to school in the village. They were married when they were 10 years of age. And they tried to marry me when I was 10 years, but I rebelled. Anyway, <laughs> so my brother had everything and did nothing, almost nothing. He was spoiled. So I asked them, why my parents and the family, why this is happening? They said, because he's a boy and you are a girl. I said, so what? They said, well, and then when they are cornered, they told me that's what God said. <laughs> so I went to my room, closed the door. The first letter I wrote in my life was to God. <laughs> <laughs> I wrote him a letter. And of course, I, I didn't know his address, but I wrote it. <laughs> and I told him, dear God, uh, you are supposed to be justice. Because my grandmother, who was a peasant, she was very brilliant. She uh, told me that God is just. She never read the Quran. She was illiterate. And uh, she told me, God is justice. We, we know God by our mind. So when I was five years, I understood God as justice, symbol of justice. That's all, full stop. 
He's not a book, he's not the Quran. So I went and I wrote the letter to God. I told him, you are supposed to be just as like as my grandmother said, but you are not just because you prefer my brother, though my, I am more intelligent than my brother. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, so uh, the point is, I told him, if you are not just, I'm not ready to believe in you. You know? And this, <laughs> and, and this is, I tell you, this is the mind of all children. All children are born creative. Girls and boys, poor and rich, black and white. We are all born creative. Creati creativity is not something for some genius writers up there. No, everybody, every child born creative. But we lose our creativity through education, socializations, inhibitions, and all, religion, and all that. So every child is sensitive and understand that there is a problem, that God is not just. But, and when I wrote, of course, the word, if you are not just, I'm not ready to believe in you, I was trembling, I was afraid because he will take me to hell, you know. But anyway, I did it. I, I wrote it, and then, of course, I, I burned the letter. The point is, if I would like to mm -hmm. answer your question, childhood is very important. And what changed me, really, is a word from my mother. My mother told me, Secretly, Nawal, there is no hell. <laughs> Nawal, the, because she was broad-minded. And my father also, in addition to my grandmother, who, who, the peasant who told me God is just, my father, he told me, criticize everything. Do not be convinced except your mind, by, by your mind. Though he graduated from Azhar from an Islamic uh, institute, but he was also uh, a dissident thinker. So I was lucky to be in this uh, family, in fact. But um, that still doesn't explain the, the call to writing. Mm -hmm. Did, I mean, you, your response to the uh, problem of the injustice in your family was to write a letter to God. Mm -hmm. um, do you trace your sense that writing was what you had to do back to that moment? What were you reading when you were a child? What was the when reading? I, I, what did I read? What were you reading when you were young? What I read? Yes. Well, I read, of course, in school. Uh, I didn't read much because we, don't, we didn't have a library in, in, in primary school or in secondary school. I used to, and I came from a poor family. Um, not rich. Uh, my father didn't buy me books. My father had a library with some Islamic books, etc., which I couldn't read. Very difficult for me, you know, the big yellow books. And uh, I used to to buy in the village, you know, or Tasilib, uh, you know, uh, children. Uh, is it groundnuts? Yes, or? something like which you. Um. So I, and in the village usually they sell uh, this little candy or something for children in papers which they cut from books. So I used to read the paper. <laughs> <laughs> After I eat the candy or something, I read it with, I was very hungry for knowledge, but I didn't find books in the village. That's why a few years ago, I established a library in my village for children to read. So just the, I mean, the idea of being a writer is a, is a strange idea. The idea? Of being a writer. It's a strange idea. And you seem to have had this idea from very young mm -hmm. without too many examples. I mean, who were the writers that you, if, if I had said to you when you were 15, a young woman of 15, um, who were the writers that you think about? Uh, of course, when I went to the medical college after high school, in high school, 
the library was very small and I found a book by Taha Hussein. Uh, he was a novelist, a very good book, and this book was very good. And in fact, Taha Hussein uh, was one of the writers who, uh, through his book, encouraged me to write. Mm -hmm. And then when I went to the medical college, of course, I started to read more and to have more books and to have discussions. And so my, my life opened up in the medical college. And so you're going through medical school, mm. you, but you're, you're writing fiction as well, not just writing notes and not just writing mm -hmm. about medical things, but you're, mm -hmm. you're writing fiction. And in fact, you published some fiction pretty much immediately after you, you finished medical school when you were still a young, very young woman. You graduated quite young. Um, did it occur to you that one possibility was just to stop all the medicine and just live as a writer? Or was that not a possibility? Uh, no. Uh, I started writing since I was a child. As I told you, the first letter to God, and then I wrote many other letters to, <laughs> to authority people in school, and I, I was really uh, very uh, challenging uh, the authority in, at home and in school, and I, I was always uh, feeling that there is something wrong in school or in the street. Because in the street, when I used to, to walk, uh, the boys used to throw stones on me because I was a girl, you know. They threw stones or say some bad words about me. So I was furious. I was not treated like my brother or like boys in the street. In school, the, the girls who came from an higher classes, from rich families, they were treated much better than us girls coming from uh, poor classes, so I was angry. And that's why I was very class conscious when I was young. And I rebelled against this class oppression, the same as I rebelled against gender oppression as a girl. So, but in, uh, when I studied medicine, in fact, it was very important because uh, Writers should study science and medicine, and should especially should know the body, should dissect the body. I, I felt a lot of pleasure in dissecting the brain <laughs> to understand, to see, to see this heart. Because usually, as a, as a writer, I used to, to write about love stories and how we love by our heart. So I wanted to see this heart, <laughs> how the heart looks. And then I made a combination or a link between the heart and the mind, and the spirit and the mind. And that's medical education, though it lacks many things, but it illuminated me to, to, to facts and to the reality of, of the body, the reality of the flesh and also seeing death every day and seeing people die every day, I started to link death to life because death is part of life and the spirit is part of the body. So in that way, I understood the human being much more than if I didn't study the body. And I, the conclusion is that facts and fiction are inseparable. Mm -hmm. In fact, when somebody tells me, oh, you are a medical doctor, why do, do you write fiction? I say there is no separation between facts and fiction. Like there is no separation between the physical and the spiritual, you know? Mm -hmm. They are one. So um, at what point did you change your response to the problem of being a woman in your society from writing to God about it, to, from, what? from writing to God, to ah. organizing, to saying, look, we women have to organize, we have to, yes. what, what, was, there, was there some event that precipitated that for you, something that happened that made you think, really, we have to do something about this, I can't just yes. complain about it, I have to act? Yes, yes, exactly. Uh, I felt that as an individual, I am vulnerable. They can shoot me. My name was 
on the death list for years. Uh, they put me in prison. They can eliminate me in a minute as an individual. But if we are a group, and that's the, the revolution, that's the meaning of revolution. Uh, revolution is collective, social revolution. It must include the majority. And that's why we did not stop the war. Why we writers and intellectuals and, pro and socialists and feminists and progressive men and women, we went in the streets demonstrating against the war, but we didn't stop the war. Why? Why? Because of this individualism, and it's embedded here, the pragmatism, individualism, that we are imprisoned in, in, in the individual. But collect, the collective is important. How to, to link the individual elimination with the collective elimination? And the revolution will start when the majority are eliminated. Number one, there is a mechanism of the revolution. Number one, awareness. When we start to know, then when we start to act, then when we start to be collective. Because if I revolt as an individual, I do nothing. If I am eliminated as an individual, I do nothing. Even if I am a very progressive writer, my effect is very small. But really, when we organize, and that's why I believe in organization. In fact, we have two major objectives in our association, the Arab Women Solidarity Association. Number one, to unveil the mind. We as writers, we not only writers, any we have to unveil, to help in unveiling our mind and the mind of others. And this by seeking knowledge, by having the courage to speak up our mind. We may be wrong, and then we learn from discussion, from different opinions, but we have to speak our mind and pay the price because freedom has a price. Freedom means responsibility. You have the price of creativity. You have to pay it in order to, to do it. Nothing without a price. So our major one objective in our association is to unveil the mind, to re-educate people and to re-educate the self, to undo what education did to us, to undo what religion did to us. We have to work on that individually and collectively. And then the other goal is to organize. When the majority start to have irreversible, true knowledge of what's happening in the world, there will be a social revolution. So I'm interested in how you actually have done this in uh, in, in worked on this in Egypt. You, we know you in part as a, mm. as a major campaigner yeah. on the question of uh, female circumcision, female genital mutilation. Um, how did that start? Uh, and, and where are we in that uh, struggle in Egypt today? Of course, uh, dictatorship in our countries, like Sadat and Mubarak, are supported by dictators here. Uh, we cannot separate between local dictatorship and global dictatorship. And they are one, and they oppress us. They op uh, when I was in prison, uh, we didn't hear any voice from, from the United States authorities. Though when some, some other writers who work with the government and they are in prison, you find them in the media, in the New York Times, in the CNN, and everybody asking for their liberation. But when really dissident writers, real dissident creative writers are in prison, the global powers are silent because they support the local powers, the local dictators. Some people think there is democracy 
in the West or in America and Europe, which is not true. Because maybe you have some freedom here, some democracy, but it's, but it's very limited. You must, uh, you must have a lot of money to be uh, elected president here. If you don't have money, you cannot be Barack Obama at all. You cannot. Because, so democracy is limited. And also dictatorship is subtle here. In our region, dictatorship is very visible. But here dictatorship is more hidden. But they are connected together. And that's why when our association was closed down, our association was closed down in 1991 because we stood against the Gulf War. So there was, we didn't hear big voices or the American authorities or the global powers say, why you, you close this association? So the, the problem is we are not really oppressed by our local regime only. We are oppressed globally and locally. And in fact, you cannot separate the global from the local. Now they used one word, glocal. Hmm. Glocal means it is, uh, they are connected. The other thing is, of course, it's a struggle. It's a continuous struggle, but we are winning. I'll give you good news. We are winning because in spite of the fact that they closed the Egyptian branch of the Arab Women's Solidarity Association, we were functioning under the International Arab Women's Solidarity Association, and we organized seven international conferences, many of them in Cairo. And I'm going back to Cairo because I won the case against the government and against the fundamentalists uh, just a few months ago because they wanted to take my Egyptian nationality from me because I wrote a play, <laughs> you know, just writing a play. So they took me to court and they wanted to rob me of my Egyptian nationality. But I was lucky because there is a movement now in Egypt and among the judges that are against fanatic fundamentalism and they are very critical of the link between the local government and neo-colonial powers in the White House. And those judges, through those judges, I won my case. So in fact, the struggle it's going on, and there is a movement in Egypt, like in any country, forward, and there is a movement backward. And I'm going back to Egypt now, after winning my case, and organizing the eighth international conference of the Arab Women's Solidarity Association. So uh, that's why I'm optimistic, you know? Mm -hmm. I'm optimistic. I feel. Maybe we are beaten, we are beaten sometimes, but we come forward. We are beaten, we go backward, and then we come forward. But you have great confidence in, in the people in Egypt, and you think that uh, if, they if they were given a clear picture of the world, they would uh, develop a democratic society, a society in which women uh, would be equal, and in which there would be no female circumcision and no male circumcision either. Um, what gives you that confidence? What gives you the confidence that if we just, if you just um, keep writing, you and, and your organization and your friends keep writing, that at some point um, things will go better? Because after all, uh, you've been writing for a while now, and you and other writers, and you've had an organization. And the general situation in Egypt doesn't seem to be improving. It doesn't seem to be terrifically much a place to be optimistic about, even though I'm glad to hear that you're optimistic about it right now. <laughs> um, so I'm wondering what gives you this confidence in, in the revolutionary potential of the people, if I may put it that old-fashioned way. Well, self-confidence is very much related to creativity, and it's something that we develop since we are young. 
and uh, it comes also from the parents and from some of the teachers. So it, and you you fight for it, and you become optimistic. I think optimistic people have self confidence. Uh, optimism means having power. Power having uh, hope. When I'm optimistic, I have hope, and hope is power. Uh, this is related to self-confidence, and also holding the pen. When you, you hold the pen and write, this is confidence. It means you have something to say. I remember many people, uh, oh, I, I feel they are writers, they, they are creative. I am inspired by them. I tell them, why don't you write? They say, oh, we cannot, we don't have the confidence to write, you know? So I think everybody here, everyone here in this room can write. Writing is like talking, like breathing. It's something natural. Writing is not something related to a few genius people. Everybody can write, but they don't have the, you, this confidence is robbed of us when we are young and we have to keep it and develop it so that we can we can do it. So I am optimistic. And even in prison, I was in prison and everybody, my friends in, in the cell were crying and saying, oh, you will be killed. And this was under Sadat and uh, I was optimistic. <laughs> in fact, I didn't have any reasonable, <laughs> but it's not a matter. <laughs> <laughs> it's not a matter of uh, the cortex, you know, <laughs> uh, 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 the superficial cortex. I, I, I believe in reason, but real reason. Because some people say reason or logic, as our friend in the New York Times who said, reason has no passion. No, reason has passion. But sometimes through education, reason becomes superficial, only in the cortex, you know. So it doesn't really. So there was no reason uh, in, my, in, in prison, no um, rationale or no, nothing in, in the air that give me hope. Because Sadat was saying, I will kill them. But still, something, the inner voice of the writer, and here is, that's what I would like to say, the self-confidence, the inner voice of the creative writer comes to you and tell you, you will survive. And I felt I will survive. And I'm surviving, <laughs> you know? Yes, but, but you've also had to spend some time outside your country. Yes. In part because you have been uh, very critical, as you were this evening, uh, of the role of, of religion uh, in our society and in your society, and at the moment in your society. Mm -hmm. um, there's a very powerful um, fundamentalist religious movement which is um, committed, among other things, uh, to killing people that it disapproves of. And I'm wondering wh what it is that persuades you that you're safe to go home right now, apart from optimism, <laughs> <laughs> which I'd like to share. Because there is no safe place. There is no safe place, number one. Uh, you know, I can have a car accident or the plane. You know, for me, I developed, maybe because of my medical profession or something, uh, I feel that death and life are one. I do, I'm not afraid of death. Death is very beautiful, in fact. I want, we are brought up to be afraid of death. This is part of religion, you know? That's how we are, the fear of death is the, the major cause that writers are, do not have the courage to write what they think. And they can, there, are, there are a lot of religious taboos everywhere, even here. You cannot really criticize Christianity or Judaism, but of course you have freedom much more freedom than us. If I, 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 I wrote a play called 
God resigns at the summit meeting. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I spent 10 years of my life comparing the Quran to the Old Testament, to the New Testament, to the three holy books, 10 years. I studied them thoroughly. I went even to India and studied the Gita because I wanted to understand the word of God, what's that? What God says? And then I discovered that those holy books are full of contradictions, racism, uh, hostility to women, um, uh, uh, hostility to the other, the stranger, the infidel, uh, uh, double morality, morality for men, morality for women. I didn't find morality, real morality, in religions, all religions. I didn't find um, freedom to think or to criticize. I felt a lot of hostility to the other. You have to kill the infidel in all religions. So I started to write. I started to express what, because knowledge is irreversible. I cannot go back and uh, abolish my knowledge. The problem I would like to say that what I noticed, and this is a big problem now, political problem, that Nobody criticized Judaism or Christianity. They criticized only Islam. And I wrote about Muslim women in the market, how women writers, Muslim women writers, who attack Islam only, they become rich and known and they are everywhere. So attack Islam is easy. Just attack Islam and your book will be everywhere. And we have to be very cautious of that. This is, a new, this is the fashion. It's very easy. I'll give you an example to say, well, Islam is against modernity. You cannot modernize under Islam. Islam is violent. You kill the infidel under Islam. But go and study Christianity. It's full of that, or Judaism. Even just remember the recent history in, in, in Serbia, how the Christians killed the Muslims under Christianity. Because some people say, well, Christianity is very pacific. Christ said when somebody slaps you, you give him, and he was very, uh, there is no violence in Christianity. No, go and study Christianity and study the history of Christianity. It's full of blood. The fight, the war between the Catholic and the Protestant in Europe. And uh, Judaism, you know, Palestine, pe Palestinian people are killed because of a verse in the Old Testament, the promised land, you know. So what I would like to say, and maybe people will not like that, we have to be just, we have to be fair. We have to be fair because this attack on Islam only is unfair and also unscientific. It's political, it's neo-colonial, and it justifies the killing of Muslims everywhere, in Afghanistan, in Palestine, everywhere. And as I told you, Ben Laden and George Bush are twins. Who encouraged uh, the Islamic fundamentalist movement? It was the American neo-colonial powers to fight the Soviet Union and communism. So they are twins. They work together and then they quarrel. Sadat was killed by the Islamic groups he created in Egypt. So the son killed the father. It's a very common story in history. Uh, I hope I, I answered your question well, about religion. So I'm wondering whether um, fairness to religion uh, uh, is also important as well as fairness among religions. Um, and I say this not because I have any metaphysical commitment uh, to religion, because, but because it seems to me that um, we, we live in a world in which most people, unlike you and me, are attracted to some faith or other. And 
if we're going to make peace in the world, I'm not sure that telling all of them that the first thing we want them to do is to abandon their religion is going to be a, a good way of moving forward. So I'm wondering, suppose you, suppose you met, after all, I mean, you know, Gandhi, Martin Luther King, these are people who had religious inspirations. I assume you, you have some sympathy with, with both of them. Um, and there are, there are many fine figures I mentioned to you the other day when we were speaking over dinner, the um, president of Al-Azhar, the, 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 the mosque university in, in Cairo, who invited the Archbishop of Canterbury to speak in his, in his, uh, from the pulpit and who, and who has said that um, if God had wanted to create one Umar, he would have. He would have created only one community of faith, but he created many, and we have to accept that this will be true to the day of resurrection. I, um, I, I find myself resonating with the words of that religious figure, and I, and I wonder if, um, though many bad things have been done in the name of religion, we should remember that many bad things have been done in the name of irreligion too. Um, uh, Stalin, Hitler, Pol Pot, not very religious, any of them. Uh, um, I agree, but I disagree, because I think we need to, to clarify the mind. The evidence of evolution is very evident now. You know, the evidence of evolution become, became very, very evident. And people need to have clarity, not to be confused. And religion is confusing, in fact. It's confusing. You don't know. It makes everything ambiguous. And I am not, again, of course there are Christian, Muslim, Jewish, Hindu, Buddhist doctors who are very kind under the so-called spirituality. I am very critical of the word spirituality. But I prefer people who are kind and also illuminated, you know, whom, who have clarity of vision. Because we are living now, religion is dangerous. I am killed by religion. People who are, re people who are religious because they are not killed by it. They are not killed by it. Mm. So it's a luxury to go to church and to listen to the music and to eat and to socialize. So it's nice to go to church, but they are not killed. People are killed under the name of God. So we have to be careful about that. And also, uh, you mentioned a very important point in relation to Ah, I, I, I spoke about the evident evolution is very evident. Religion, in effect, hinders social revolution. It encourages counter-revolution. Look at the Taliban. Did, how, what do we call? How can, look at the Taliban, what they are doing. I am receiving letters from Afghan women and from Iraqi women, because Iraqi women are so, also in a very bad situation because of revival of religious fundamentalist movement. And uh, some Iraqi women, they write to me and they tell me, Nawal, you know, we were much better under Saddam Hussein. But now, under Saddam Hussein, there was no religious strife. There is no conflict between the Sunnah and the Shia. It's we could walk in the street with no veil and we could go to universities. Now we cannot walk in the street. In Afghanistan, the Taliban uh, burn the women who go to schools. So women now in Iraq and Afghanistan, between two fires, between the hell of the fundamentalist religious fanatic movement and foreign occupation. And they are linked. Foreign occupation encourages religious fundamentalism. You see now in Afghanistan how the American army is indifferent to women problems because they want to, to have relation with the power, with the religious power with the Taliban. So they sacrifice women's rights in order to have alliance 
with the power. And this is happening all the time in Egypt also, when we had the revival of the uh, Islamic groups and the Christian groups, etc. And the Muslim brothers wanted to have uh, uh, to connect with the government, and the government wanted to connect with the Muslim brothers who have power, they sacrificed women's rights. You know, so that's why it's very important to have principles. Uh, religious people are a bit, are not generalizing, but religion encourages pragmatism, you know, not ethics. Some people think morality and ethics in religions. No, it encourages pragmatism and going away from principles. We need to stick to principles. Justice, freedom, love, peace. Where is peace in religion? Where is peace? There is war all the time. If you are fighting the infidel, if you are fighting the stranger, the other, where is peace? I didn't find peace. Did you find peace? Well, um, again, <laughs> uh, I find myself uh, uh, I, I'm not sure that I like uh, be, being where I am uh, in this, uh, <laughs> being placed where I am. But again, I, it is important that in those large crowds that you said rightly uh, were ignored when they spoke around the world against uh, the invasion of Iraq, uh, there were many people who were there speaking for peace in the name of, of the Quaker movement, which is a powerful Christian tradition, which has been opposed to warfare consistently for a very long time and very bravely um, in, in times when it's been extremely unpopular in the United States. Opposition to war is usually unpopular in the United States, but, it, it, but the, the intensity of that unpopularity has, has changed from time to time, and, and Quakers really have suffered, subjected themselves to enormous suffering for religious reasons in order to uh, disconnect themselves from the peace, uh, from I, the war I movements. I remind of you of your father. What happened to your father with Nekroma, you know, in Ghana? Well, ah. he was locked up. Uh, but my father, I think my father would have said, and I'm sure he would have said, that part of what motivated him in his resistance to uh, what he thought of, I think correctly, as an oppressive regime, was his faith, his Christian faith uh, in, in justice, uh, in human equality, uh, and, in, uh, and in the equals, uh, yes. the equality of all people. He was a freedom God. fighter. He was a freedom fighter, yes. but, he was, but I think he would have said that he was a freedom fighter in part motivated by his religion, which is, which, which is one of the examples that, that makes me resistant to the idea that the problem is religion in itself rather than uh, particular forms of religion. I'm happy to agree with you, of course, mm -hmm. that, 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 that to, I'm uh, deeply opposed to the Taliban and what they've been trying to do. Uh, and I do agree with you that the Taliban exists and has the power it has in part because of f very foolish decisions made by the United States uh, in its foreign policy in, in Pakistan and in Afghanistan. I completely agree with all yeah. that. Um, but if I'm looking for allies to, in the struggle to protect uh, women's rights in Afghanistan, I'm expecting uh, among my allies to have Quaker friends, uh, I think even some uh, Catholic friends, uh, Baptist friends, people who are not just anti-Islam, but pro-women's equality, and who see women's equality as something that uh, is a consistent part of their religious tradition, even though uh, they would admit that their tradition has to be criticized for playing a role in, in the past uh, in the continuous oppression of women. So I suppose it, really the choice is between an evolutionary and a revolutionary <laughs> view of religion. Do we want to see religion as something where we can pull good things out of it uh, into the future? Or do we want to see it as something that we need to eradicate in the revolution because uh, nothing good can come of it? And I'm, I'm I guess, um, at least not persuaded that the answer has to be the revolutionary answer in that particular case. Uh, I, 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 I am dreaming uh, because I am living uh, in Egypt. Uh, we've been suffering all the time. 
all our life from this use and misuse of religion in politics. But religion allowed that. Religion is a political ideology. If you study the holy books, they are political books, economic books, sexual books. They deal with everything. So in fact, religion, religion is politics. Religion allow politics to come in and oppression to come in. So I want to separate totally between religion and state so that ever, the laws are clear. Religion is very, very private. Even I want protect to protect children from being indoctrinated when they are young by a certain religion. I am against that because Because I met professors who are very scientific and they are with evolution and they say, yes, evolution, etc., etc. But deep inside them, they are religious in, in a fanatic way because of childhood. So we cannot get rid of, uh, of, uh, of childhood, of the psyche because religion is embedded in our psyche since we are children. And that's why I am very much against religious education to children. But, but the problem is, in fact, what I am saying may be uh, a bit radical, but we need to be radical. <laughs> we need, we need to be radical. Because are, are we going to have this world going on like that? Or should we speak up? It's time. It's time to speak up. Even you can discuss with me. But through this discussion, we can reach something. Because this cannot go on. What's happening in Afghanistan? What's happening in, in Egypt? You, you know, if I come to circumcision, female circumcision, it's increasing since the Islamic groups had power under Sadat. Veiling of women increased, and female circumcision increased, and now we have the percentage of female circumcision in Egypt now is 97%. And male circumcision also is very harmful, but people are silent. They don't speak about that even here because it is mentioned in, in the Old Testament. There is a verse in the Old Testament that, about the promised land. You, you know it, that God said to Ibrahim, you have to, I give you the promised land of Canaan, Palestine, on condition that you circumcise your boys to cut the foreskin uh, of the boy. So the, uh, even in one of my books, I said, what's the relationship between the invasion of Palestine and cutting the foreskin of the uh, penis? You know, what's the relationship? It, it, this didn't make logic to me. You know, so uh, that's part of my studies to the holy books. So uh, what I would like to say, writers, if we writers do not speak up our mind, and pay the price. Who will do that? Who will do it? That might be a good question with which to end. <laughs> Thank you very much indeed. <laughs> <laughs>